The Bible reading this morning is from Ecclesiastes chapter 1. These are the words from the teacher, son of David and king of of Jerusalem. Everything is so meaningless. The teacher says that it is all a waste of time. Do people really gain anything from all the hard work they do in this life? People live and people die, but the earth continues forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down, and then it hurries to rise again in the same place. The wind blows to the south, and the wind blows to the north. The wind blows around and around, then it turns and blows back to the place it began. All rivers flow again and again to the same place. They flow to the sea, but the sea never becomes full. Words cannot fully explain things, but people continue speaking. Words come again and again to our ears, but our ears don't become full, and our eyes don't become full of what we see. All things continue the way they have been since the beginning. The same things will be done that have always been done. There is nothing new in this life. Someone might say, look, this is new, but that thing has always been there. It was here before we were. People don't remember what happened long ago. In the future, they will not remember what is happening now. And later, other people will not remember what the people before them did. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. And to those online too, uh, welcome. So that was encouraging, wasn't it? (laughs) You might have noticed that I've... um, some of you might have noticed that I've um, had a fascination with Ecclesiastes lately and uh, we're looking at it uh, Tuesday night and Thursday night, so that's my fault, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I've really found Ecclesiastes fantastic, so I want to encourage you, I found that it's a frank and honest assessment of life under the sun. Now, the version that Ian read didn't mention under the sun, but it said in this life term under the sun is here on earth right now. The reader doesn't attempt to sugarcoat or state any more than his observations. He also provides us with advice in the form of proverbs, things that he has learnt. He's trying to convey the futility of this short life. and the vanity of placing our hope in pleasure and wealth. Hopefully, this brief summary that I will attempt will spark your interest in Ecclesiastes. Because the more I read it, the more I get out of it. So, let's pray. Lord, we're here ready to listen. What do you have for us today? Help us to hear you speak, to gain wisdom for life, because your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Apply this understanding to our lives. Grant us wisdom, we ask. Amen. There are probably three parts of Ecclesiastes that you are very familiar with. The first one I'm going to mention is the uh, in chapter 3, where it says there's a time for this and a time for that. Do you remember that one? A time to be born and a time to die. 
Um, and the writer is very fascinated with death or the end of life. Um, and there was a, uh, many years ago, there was a, uh, a, a song written by a, 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 a um, group called The Birds, Turn, Turn, Turn. And uh, that was based on this chapter. The other uh, frequent use is in weddings. And uh, from chapter 4 in particular, um, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. And in, in verse 10 it says, For if they fall, one will lift up the other. So that's often quoted at weddings. The other you'll hear a lot at funerals. In chapter 5, As he came from his mother's womb, he shall Go again, naked as he came. He shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. And in 12, chapter 12, it says, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So those are often quoted at funerals. I'm not going to follow those uh, themes. I will talk a bit about the author. There are two thoughts. Um, it says in verse 1, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Ecclesiastes follows Proverbs. And it's believed that Proverbs is written by um, King Solomon. And Ecclesiastes is followed by Song of Songs, which is also believed to be written by Solomon. Um, but there is also a, a, an opinion that um, Solomon was the teacher and someone else has written what he said. Regardless of that, let's talk about Solomon. He was born to Bathsheba and uh, took over at the end of David's reign, King David. And in Kings, we read, uh, Solomon loved the Lord and walked in the statute statutes of David his father and one day the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and asked what shall I give you that'd be good wouldn't it God come and say what shall I give you and Solomon said you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David my father And then he talks about the righteousness and uprightness of his heart. And now, O Lord, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I'm but a little child, and I don't know how to manage these people. Give your servant understanding, mind to govern your people, and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern them? This pleased the Lord because God, because he asked of God wisdom. And this is very important to the book of Ecclesiastes. And God said, because you've asked for wisdom, I'll also give you a long life and riches. And you will walk in my ways and you will keep my statutes and my commands as your father did. And you'll have a long life. 
So Ecclesiastes uses a lot of words like vanity. It's not a word we use a lot. Usually that it tends to mean sort of pride, but um, in this case it's, it means more um, uh, meaningless. Uh, the term vapour, uh, havel, which is apparently meaning a short breath, um, a chasing after the wind, pointlessness, fleeting, striving. Those are some of the reasons why we might struggle with Ecclesiastes. It seems to put a damper on things, doesn't it? The tone of the book appears to be drab and despairing. Bear with me because I hope that I can change that. And as David says when he preaches, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm going to attempt four to, to pick out four topics or four themes that Ecclesiastes has. First one being working and striving and enjoying your life. And the other one is evil under the sun or an un unhappy business. Those are terms that he uses. The third one is wisdom. And the fourth one is who can understand God? Let's go. Chapter 1, verse 3. Meaningless vanity. What does a man gain by all his toil in which he toils under the sun? All the streams run to the sea, but the sea is never full. To the place the streams run, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. Oh, how are you going so far? In chapter 2, it's much more encouraging. The writer tells us how he tried every possible pleasure that is available to a king under the sun. He said, I said in my heart, um, come, now, I will test you with pleasure and enjoy yourself. And you'd think a king would have every available opportunity for that. So he built houses and plant vineyards and fruit trees and gardens and many servants, herds and flocks and singers and concubines. And it said, I had more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. So he had it all. And it could have taken years of doing this and in chapter 2 verse 10 it says and whatever my eyes desired I did not keep from them so he as king he could go yep I want that let's have it build, build me a moat build me a ship build me this and I kept my heart from no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was the reward for my toil. Well, did a king really toil or did everyone else around him? That's my question. Then he said, after all of this, maybe years of, of accumulating things that he liked, I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended in doing it. And behold... All was vanity and a striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Well, that was encouraging. <clears throat> there was nothing held back in the pursuit of pleasure under the sun. And we look around today and it appears that that's exactly what everyone is doing is pursuing pleasure and wealth. Then he talks about um, the fact that we work all our life and you have wise and you have the fools. He 
and dif dif differentiates between wisdom and the fools. But he says, just as the wise person will die, so will the fool. So I hated life. Because what was done under the sun was grievous to me. For this vanity and striving after the wind, I hated my toil. And he realised that everything he accumulates would be left to somebody else when he dies. Despite this apparent despair, he goes on to say... There is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat? Who can find enjoyment? For to the one who pleases God, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. Do you see the subtle distinction? And, he, and there's throughout uh, the whole book, he repeats that. So in, that was in chapter 2 uh, and chapter 3. He says, I perceive there was nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil. For this is God's gift to man. Everyone who God has given wealth and possessions and power, enjoy them. To accept his lot and to rejoice in his toil, this is a gift of God. I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun to eat and drink and be joyful. For God has given this under the sun. God has already approved what you do. So there are some who would say, oh, we shouldn't enjoy life. It is evil. There's that whole, is that asceticism, I think, um, where you know, the body is bad and the spirit is good. But he's decided that that's not the case, that we should enjoy. So amongst this discontent that he is very... And vocal about the preacher as he calls himself has determined that we are to enjoy our lives because it's a gift from God evil and unhappy business the preacher this is um, in chapter 1 verse 12 the preacher uh, Oh, sorry, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out wisdom and all that is done under heaven. And he said, it is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. And I, my question there, is this God's doing or man's folly? Then he talks about oppression. I saw oppression that is done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed. And they had no one to comfort them. The oppressors have power, and there's no help for the ones who are oppressed. We see a lot of oppression in this world around us. And why is that? He also goes on to say, Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from man's envy of his neighbour. That's interesting. So we want what our neighbour's got. 
I think it's a very accurate observation. Our media and our advertising rely on envy and lust, wanting what someone else has. Then he goes on to say in chapter 4, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is a vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his own eyes? There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. And I take the evil, the term evil, to be unfairness, maybe. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. So we can be given wealth. And many would say, I earned it. But then we can lose it just as quick. This is interesting. There is another evil under the sun that lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth and possessions and honour so that he lacks nothing. Yet he is unable to enjoy it. And then a stranger enjoys it when he's gone. So that's, um, is he blaming God here? He talks, he's talking about the pursuit of wealth. There is a certain curse attached to the pursuit of wealth. He also talks about uh, comments on righteousness. Next, he says, Surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Can you think where we've also heard that? In Romans 3, <coughs> it is written, None is righteous, not one. No one understands and no one seeks God. In chapter 7, the writer says, or the preacher says, See, this alone I found, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. So we have made in the image of God, but we have sought our own schemes. So there's a lot of unhappy business, isn't there? Stay with me. Wisdom. Surely wisdom is to be desired and to be pursued. And we hear that Solomon was very wise. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom, all that has been done under heaven. And I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has, been, has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied <coughs> my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And then he said the most bizarre thing. I perceive this is also a striving after the wind. 
Why is that? Surely we'd want to know wisdom. Maybe not. The writer suggesting the pursuit of wisdom is a waste of time. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can a man do who comes after the king? So he's a king after David. David was a very wise man. Can he, has, can he add anything to that? I can only do what's been done before. Then I saw there is more gain in wisdom than folly. As there is in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. So the pursuit of wisdom on its own, apart from God, is vanity, a chasing after the wind. But he does acknowledge the, the um, benefit of wisdom. In 7 he says, For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge, knowledge is the wisdom is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers. All this I have tested by wisdom and said, I will be wise. But it was far from me. So we decide to be wise and we cannot. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? So when we pursue wisdom, we find that we cannot. However, he recognises that there is wisdom and he says it makes a man's face shine and the hardness of his face changes. He says, I say that wisdom is better than might and wisdom is better than the weapons of war. This is one of the Proverbs that he quotes in chapter 10. The words of a wise man's mouth wins him favour, but the lips of a fool consume him. It seems contradictory, doesn't it, that he's criticising the pursuit of wisdom and yet he's saying that wisdom is something good to have. I love this one. This will do your head in. or did mine a head in. It says, Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Hey, Say what? <laughs> Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked. Neither be a fool or you might die before your time. Intriguing, isn't it? All this I have tested by wisdom. I will be wise, but it was far off from me. A man's wisdom... Oh, sorry, I've read that one, haven't I? Apologies. So we'll go to the fourth... Point, who can understand God? In chapter 2, 
He says, For the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give one who pleases God. This also is a vanity and striving after the wind. There is a time for everything. I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy, to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We do have a sense of eternity in our hearts. Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? What happens after life? And we do have a sense of justice. We get angry when someone is we're done wrong by or someone else is done wrong by. In chapter 3, he says, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken away. God has done it so that people will fear him. So God's acts Sorry, God acts by his word. We see that in Genesis. He speaks and he creates. His word is enduring. So his actions are enduring, are forever. If we seek comfort in creation pleasures we will not fear God and that is meaningless I said in my heart God will judge the righteous and the wicked for there is a time for every matter and for every work Because God is testing us. So we read earlier about oppression. How others oppress each other. And we see that around us. But he's saying that God will judge, is judging. So we should let him be judge. I like this proverb in chapter 5. <clears throat> Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer sacrifices of fools. Be not rash with your mouth. Do not let your heart be hasty or to utter a word to God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Let your words be few. For God is the one you must fear. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? We're gaining a perspective of God here. There are times when we try to bring God down to our level. And 
And this relates also to prosperity. So when God blesses us, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made one as well as the other. So that man may not find out anything that will be after him. We cannot fathom God. He is a mystery. My son, be aware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is weariness of the flesh. At the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. God is righteous. He is a judge and he hates injustice. So to summarise, working and striving... This also I saw, everything is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? So everything is meaningless unless we do it in relationship with God. Why is pleasure so fleeting? So few days of our mean, meaningless life because we will not find fulfilment in the creation. We will only find fulfilment in the Creator. Remember your Creator, fear God. Striving to have wealth and power in this short life is vanity and pointless. Oppression is a result of people having and using power over others. And that's not according to God's will. God is righteous and he's true. Be assured, God will bring every deed into judgment. Wisdom. The pursuit of wisdom on its own, apart from God, is chasing the wind. Seek God, fear him. That's true wisdom. Who can understand God? Many have tried to understand the Almighty. Many have questioned his ways. Many try to be judge for God. But Romans also says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I think Ecclesiastes points out what has captured our hearts. What is it that we really desire? Because most of it is meaningless. We're reminded that we don't have control of our life because we could die tomorrow. Meaningless, sorry, meaning and purpose can only be found 
through God. Let's pray. God, you are awesome in power and might. And we're your children. And we seek, so often we seek, to find our own way. But there is no other way than through you. And we thank you that you are righteous in all your ways. That anything that we desire will be found through you. We praise you for your word and for your goodness. Amen.